It's great to be here. I'm going to um, start by reviewing some um, kind of tenets I came up with in, 19, in no, 2003. I was asked to speak to a conference in Portland on public art. It was a conference which wanted to address the issue of success and was how did we do that and how do we figure out if we as people in the art community are, are successful at our jobs and are our projects successful. So I think this will be a, it's a foundation for um, my talk and it's a foundation I think for my work. So let me just read you what I came up with in 2003 and I'll have a few words about addressing uh, thoughts on my review of these 2003 what I call strategies for success, and you can evaluate them as I go along, and some of you may agree, may not agree. So um, in no order, but number one, these are strategies for success. I want to repeat that. Understand and respect that public art must, can, and should be art. Cultivate respect and awe for knowledge, appreciation, and commitment to art. Learn from and do not be intimidated by failure. Support and respect curiosity and tolerance as intrinsic values and cornerstones of all that we do. Embrace and support constant evolution in structure and content. Share information and resources. Build bridges to and with others. Be generous. So I found upon reviewing these tenets that I came up with, I know tenets is kind of a too big a word, but these strategies that I came up with in 2003, I basically agreed that these covered a lot of what I hoped that I had incorporated and brought to my work with a few exceptions and that I hope I've been able to, and my colleagues have been able to move toward an inclusion of a seventh strategy or could be eight. And I would need to think about um, equity and inclusivity and how we represent the broader aspirations of our very diverse culture. Art can and should prompt joy, affirmation, and new horizons. Our realities negotiate suffering. These are intrinsic human experiences that art can and must reflect. So when Penny asked me to give this talk, one of the words that came up was this idea of bold work. And so I started thinking, well, what, what could promote bold work in some kind of consistent way? And, and in particular, since I'm giving the talk and it's about work I've done, it was how it might have come to pass that I was able to be part of so many projects that I think have a bold um, uh, conclusion. And part of it, I have to say, is because I'm an artist. And my ability to work with artists and be um, uh, fascinated by their process and by their thinking um, is something I understand very innately, both, I, I would say, innately and also by training. I think that makes a big difference, although curators who come from backgrounds of art history or other kinds of training have other tolerances and passions they bring to their conversation. and and their um, working relationships with artists, I think the compatriot aspect of my own being uh, has been very fruitful for my work with artists. So I want to share with you a number of projects today in which I played a hybrid role. Using my knowledge and passion for art and exercising a pragmatic streak and an ability to assist others in strategically organizing themselves and their projects. Those of you who have watched some of the brilliant projects of the Association for Public Art coming to being, no doubt realize the challenges that go into creating anything of great value that is respectful of both the public and of art, and that advances and explores the best natures and values of each. Let's start with a symbol of hope and an image of our planet as a hospitable and magical place, admittedly a highly idealistic and perhaps even a provocative proposition. Rainbow by Tony Tassett is a 94-foot-high sculpture of steel, 
evoking an ephemeral moment composed entirely of water and light. The improbability of translating a fleeting climatic event, one with a concrete physical presence into a permanent object, is a poetic affirmation of our ability to celebrate and honor the infinite, untamable forces that surround and sustain our small planet. Such gestures will hopefully help us understand the need to respect and care for the systems upon which the Earth depends. An important precedent to Tacit's rainbow must be acknowledged in Isma Noguchi's monumental A Tribute to Franklin, one of Philadelphia's many great public artworks. Tacit's Rainbow was commissioned by Sony Pictures Entertainment for its studio in Culver City, California. The lot is one of the preeminent sites of Hollywood's golden era, having been built as the home for MGM in 1924. Among the countless classic films made on the lot was The Wizard of Oz, whose most memorable song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, served as inspiration for the monumental sculpture that is sited a few hundred feet from the very soundstage on which it was filmed. We generally expect public art to provide sensitive, relevant, and hopefully inspired response to the conditions in which the art is situated and our unfolds. And Rainbow does this in a deft way. It connects the site to an important moment of history while also advocating for relevance as an image and object worthy and able to stand on its own terms. Light is the medium of film, and tacit sculpture concretizes that fact. It is a technicolor riff on film and also on the light and space movement that is identified with Los Angeles's place as an international contemporary art center. OK, now we're going to Penny's one of her favorites. I was hoping you were going to say it was your absolute favorite. There was nothing like it anywhere, <laughs> except maybe in Philadelphia. So here we are, where we've got a bird's eye view of Magnolias for Pittsburgh. This also offers a take on ephemeral and the fleeting, that being the short-lived but vividly experienced burst of color that signals the beginning of spring. This piece was commissioned by the Sports and Exhibition Authority of Pittsburgh as part of the art program of the David L. Lawrence Convention Center. Due to changes in the design of the center, Magnolias was ultimately sited a few blocks away in a small public plaza. Tacit's two life-size bronze magnolia trees, which you see here very clearly, with over 900 hand-painted blossoms, so you saw one of them, there were 900 more though, 899, permanently remain in the glory of full spring bloom while the living magnolias, among which the sculptures are placed, go through their natural seasonal cycle and join their artful cousins for two weeks of climatic symmetry every year. So here's another. We're on the ground plane now looking at the two bronze sculptures. And so here we have on the left is a natural organic object, and on the right is a piece of bronze. And I wanted to show something about how art is made, not just showing you, you know, the finished object. We're now in Tony Tassett's backyard. So some of this stuff is, gets very homey. The bronze trees themselves were cast in a foundry in upstate New York. They were moved to Tony's backyard in um, a suburb of Chicago, where he and a crew hand painted the 900 bronze flowers and then affixed them to the bronze uh, s structure. Okay, Penny. We're very good. We're in sync here. And then here's the installation shot of these things being put into place in the plaza. Two large commissions for a new state of California courthouse in Long Beach, California. Oops. Oh, okay. This is good because Penny showed the, the clay things being made from the sculptures and the snake. And so um, this is a paper origami project under the um, 
the magnolias in Pittsburgh. So the kind of the the the, the uh, prompts that sculpture can give to all kinds of other activities, from creating poetry and music to creating smaller sculptures, is really endless. And I salute uh, the uh, Association for Public Art in taking advantage of these opportunities to be inspired and moved to make things that come from the sculptures that enliven our creativity and conversation. So now we're back in Long Beach, California. So two large commissions for a new state of California courthouse in Long Beach also directly reference nature and in particular movement resulting from wind and air currents. Ned Kahn's air columns is comprised of four 50-foot elements on 10-foot bases that reference classic columns from Greek temples, kind of like this building we're in now a common architectural feature in traditional American courthouses and museums. However, unlike solid marble columns, Kahn's towers are semi-transparent, composed of thousands of small aluminum plates on pivots that rotate with the slightest breeze, creating a sensation of movement and flux opposed to the static state associated with architecture. So here's a detail. There were thousands of these things. They're in three concentric rings. And um, before this was installed, Ned needed to test the durability of the uh, hinges and the silicon um, channels that these things were set into. And he didn't have access to a wind tunnel, but he had access to a <laughs> flatbed truck, which he drove through the countryside in Sonoma, California. So I take this as part of an artist's ingenuity, is how do you mimic a test of a wind tunnel without access to a wind tunnel? There were 34 of these sections in each of the four columns. So you get to see an idea of the amount of work that goes into something like this. A similar sensation of motion is present in an artwork in the building's lobby, adjacent to the exterior portico that houses Kahn's columns. Jennifer Steinkamp's dazzling animated artwork, Murmuration, floats above the lobby floor, contained within a 35 by 20 foot media mesh display. Her animation of feathers floating and rotating, as if suspended in a gentle breeze, is a fine companion to Kahn's exterior kinetic artwork. Both projects are visually alluring with captivating movement and shifting rhythms. Considering the tense environment of the courthouse where family law and criminal cases are adjudicated, the presence of the two artworks offer building users, both staff and visitors, opportunities to refocus their attention and hopefully find respite and enjoyment if only for a moment or two. It's pretty amazing, actually, um, the amount of technical interface that we had to find uh, between the artwork and the, um, the building systems. And it's to Jennifer Steinkamp's and the architect's um, great intelligence and fortitude that they worked through all of the multiple challenges, which were uh, quite astonishing to make such a beautifully calming and formally perfect artwork. Well, believe it or not, I've got one more floating, shifting, and mesmerizing artwork to share. It's kind of a subcategory I never knew I sort of could use. Roman de Salvo's Stratus Eucalyptus was created for an outdoor plaza for the San Diego headquarters of the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans. The work is composed of 47 complex longitudinal sections of eucalyptus trees, incorporating trunks and branches. DeSalvo worked with an arborist to identify 17 suitable dead trees. This is California, Sierra Club looking over our shoulders on everything, uh, which were milled into the organic plank forms you see in this image of the completed artwork. DeSalvo's response to this site is brilliant in both form and content. By suspending the sculpture approximately 30 feet above the ground plane, the work is responsive to the air currents that come down Mission Valley to San Diego Bay 
and gently move the giant floating artwork. Additionally, Stratus eucalyptus can be seen from multiple vertical perspectives. From looking up while on the ground plane to looking down from the fourth floor pedestrian bridge to perspectives available from lower bridges that connect the two main buildings of the campus. The linear composition of the sculpture is a fine stand-in for the topographic maps and for the pathways and networks that represent Cal transmission to provide and enhance mobility and transportation for the state of California. And again, I just want to show you some of the behind the scenes. It's like if you went to see a play and you got to go into the, the green room, how these things are made. And I assume you've, some of you have seen some of the installations of, of projects here in Philadelphia. So here we are on cherry pickers, lifted up 30 feet. Roman is on the left. And these many separate sections are being put together. But because these are floated 30 feet and not arranged in the stable ground plane in which they were made, they had to adjust uh, using all these wenches. Uh, each piece had to be adjusted as they were being installed. So it was quite a feat, last minute adjustments. And here we're in Roman's studio, which happened to be a garage that Caltrans lent him. And I think this shows one of the great uh, benefits of working with large institutions, as long as they're generous, and that is the resources they can bring. So uh, Caltrans was able to find a space at no cost to Roman large enough to lay out half of Stratus Eucalyptus, um, making it possible for him to figure out some of the technical adjustments which would be meet, need to be made prior to installation. In the Los Angeles headquarters of Caltrans, Renee Green's code survey likewise investigates new approaches to formal and thematic dimensions in public art. Code survey is an artwork that exists in both physical and virtual space. Adjacent to the building's public plaza, invisible through a glass wall is a cafeteria, wherein the physical manifestation of the artwork is cited. A grid of 168 photo etched glass panels displaying images related to transportation and its role in California's history. A companion grid sits on the home page of the Los Angeles Caltrans headquarters website. By clicking on any image, one is directed to five links. Some are audio files, some are video files, some are images and texts. Each link unfolds the image deeper and deeper into a narrative. For example, we start with this photograph of some soldiers exiting a Red Cross vehicle. Click to the links, select the text link, and a quotation from John Steinbeck's East of Eden relating to automobiles, and the caption to the photo refers to the fact that the soldiers are African Americans. Green selections of images emphasizes the role of minorities and the underrepresented in California history, all viewed through some form of transportation. Jenny Holzer's Fort Pittsburgh is sited on the roof of the David L. Lawrence Convention Center. The artwork is composed of two rows of specially designed wands of LEDs. Each row lines the rim of the dramatic curved roof as it separates the build on the building's top deck, creating an open space from one end of the building to the other. Over 340 feet of LEDs are arrayed on each row. The LEDs scroll day and night using three separate programs. Each program is comprised of the full text of a book relevant to Pittsburgh, including From This Furnace by Thomas Bell, an American Childhood by Annie Dillard, and Homewood Trilogy by John Edgar Wideman. The text is easily read from the roof deck and some buildings on the sidewalk on the city side of the building. From the river, the LEDs provide a sculptural and kinetic light presence that joins many of the other monumental lighting elements occupying both sides of the Allegheny River. For Pittsburgh, is both a narrative artwork that speaks to the city in which it is located, as well as a form of art and architecture that joins the civic collection of illuminated nocturnal experiences.
Steve Appleton's FaceTime interactive sculpture is located in a small plaza adjacent to the intersection of Sunset and Vine in Hollywood. This is the heart of Filmland, ground zero for self-promotion, celebrity, and photographic imagery most nakedly represented in the well-known headshot, the currency of exchange for actors. Into this hotbed of desire and media overload, Appleton has created an artwork that understands and represents these aspects of media culture, and at the same time offers an experience that repurposes media and technology into a democratic and public spectacle. Here on the left, we see the plaza just off Vine Street during the daytime with the key elements of the artwork. Silver discs of varying diameters arrayed up and down a 70-foot wall, an aluminum sculpture housing electronics, and unseen, basically just above the top of the image, is a projector mounted onto a robotic hinge, allowing it to freely rotate and sweep the opposite wall with a beam of light evocative of Clegg lights roving the night sky signaling a movie premiere. The image on the right shows FaceTime in its full operational glory. The sculpture presents a sensuous, humorous, quasi-human form, and housed within it is a complex set of electronic equipment, including a camera, computer, and a projector. As people approach the sculpture, the camera, placed within the small ear element with the bright white light, captures the viewer's face, Face recognition software within the computer filters out other imagery. And the face is displayed in a live feed projected onto the four foot diameter screen. The captured image is also housed into an archive which provides a constant feed of new faces available for the robotic projector above the sculpture to access and beam onto the opposite wall as we see here in the slightly green face to the right and above the sculpture above and behind. So here we have many of the emblematic symbols of Hollywood put into a playful and inviting interactive artwork. Another project that incorporates a form of robotic and tracking technology is Christian Muller's Mojo. Here the location is San Pedro, the community that includes the massive port of Los Angeles. Just a few blocks away from Mojo, one can see the complex system of cranes and other loading machines that use robotic technology to move shipping containers on and off giant cargo ships. Muller uses a robotic arm not to move heavy cargo, but to house a spotlight that can track pedestrians at night as they move within a 30-foot feet of the column that supports the arm. Can we get the sound off of that? Thanks. Uh, um, surveillance technology and tracking cameras feed motion data to the robotic arm so that it can follow movement on the sidewalk. The arm moves during both evening and daylight hours, but at night the artwork really comes to life as the lighting element adds an additional layer of engagement for the public and makes a lovely reference to the nearby Point Furman Lighthouse, a famous landmark in San Pedro. And you're laughing because that is a, the most appropriate response to this work. It has an element of silliness and ridiculousness and scariness that Christian definitely wanted to put into a sort of a humorous context. And another silly thing that came up was the paranoia in the community meetings that happened before this thing was approved. And people were sure that all our motives were very nefarious because we were using surveillance technology. I'd like to conclude the section of permanent artwork with one made with century-old tools and technology, but finds integrity intelligence as a work of contemporary art through its daring scale. Gwen Murrell carved two enormous eagles into the limestone walls of a building in downtown Pasadena using chisels, sanders, and scaffolding. 
essentially processes that go back to Mesopotamian times, with the exception of the electric sanders. One eagle spreads its wings 60 feet across the building's facade. This project also opens conversation about the relationship between art and architecture and artists and architecture. Very appropriate in Pasadena, a city made famous by the integrated art and architecture of the Green and Green Brothers, who created masterpieces of craftsman residences in the early 20th century. We were fortunate to have a supporting building owner and Steve Nakata as the architect for this project. Steve's openness and enthusiasm to have Gwen carve into the expensive limestone material, permanently and clearly altering the facade's presence, made for a most productive partnership. So again, I mean, it's fascinating. I think one of the pleasures if you work in public art is, to, is that final on-the-site completion of the work. And for, for Gwen, the completion, the installation was literally the making of it. You know, she had sketches, but to, she came here with literally chisels and sanders and scaffolding and worked um, for weeks to make this thing a reality. So I'm now going to shift gears. We've looked at work. Uh, which according to the title of tonight's talk are eternal, um, which is kind of a frightening thought. Um, but they're permanent, whatever that means. These buildings are not gonna last forever, but they have a long lifespan. And now we're gonna look at a number of things which were um, very much developed to exist quite uh, ephemerally. And that is works for um, two projects. One I'm just gonna, isn't complete. It's um, a project that the city of Los Angeles is undergoing now that was very fortunate to uh, have received a very large grant from the Bloomberg Philanthropies, who had an, a public art initiative uh, last year in which four cities received approximately a million dollars. And the city of Los Angeles was one of the recipients, and I was serving as the artistic director of this program, which will debut in July of this summer. And I just want to give you a sense of the scale. Los Angeles is a massive city. It's over, I think, oh, it's almost 300 square miles. It's huge. And these are the 15 council districts which make up the city. And each council district will have either a temporary public artwork or um, some kind of public art programming. But the project that I'm really going to spend time on, the remaining time I have, is um, something called GLOW. A GLOW is an um, all-night art event, very much uh, in debt to something called Nuit Blanche, which is something the uh, Paris governor in the early 2000s, 2001, I believe, created as a way to reinvigorate Paris as a contemporary art center, and also to constantly think about new ways of enlivening our public life in our cities. And this all-night art event was one of his greatest um, achievements. And um, my great friend Jessica Cusick and I got the idea through a Parisian who had witnessed this event to perhaps take it on in Santa Monica, not in streets full of medieval courtyards, but on the Pacific Ocean in Santa Monica. So we began thinking about this in 2006. And in 2008, the first glow occurred. Um, so one night on the beach, we had no idea what we were doing. We were naive, uh, we were optimistic, and uh, we were nervous as hell. We had a very supportive city. Santa Monica, as you may know, is a very progressive city. It's small, that helped it, that the, um, the, the event could be contained on the beach with a little spillover into the downtown area. So um, we had every reason to believe that, that we could do something pretty interesting with the kind of support we had. And uh, lo and behold, the first time we did Nui, uh, first time we did Glow in 2008, we had an audience of 250,000 people, which was 220,000 more than we had expected. <laughs> so our audience um, prognostication skills were very poor. But our skills at creating something that people wanted to come to were very high. 
and we had to work on getting those into alignment so that things would run a little more smoothly the second time. And one of the things we did the second time, which is an unusual thing to do if you're in the art business, is we wanted to um, create a smaller audience. That was one of our marketing tasks, was to make it less attractive. It's kind of bizarre, but that's actually what we did. So I'm going to run you through some of these projects, because they're, they're, their diversity and their complexity and um, their spirit is something I always delight in sharing. And um, this is the opening ceremony in 2010. It's an event called Howling at the Sun. And it is based on a um, Tongva, Tongva being the native peoples of sort of the Santa Monica Bay region. And the event is, um, there's a catastrophe coming, which is typical in many um, tribal myths. And, and how are we going to avert this catastrophe, or how are we going to succumb to it in a graceful uh, way? Is that the, um, if, if um, there's enough chanting and dancing, the sun will not crash into the earth. So there's a great motive for participation and for a lot of screaming and, and sort of uh, dynastic dancing. So um, this was the opening on which the mayor spoke and the um, consul general of France spoke because we did salute our French uh, brethren as a sort of spirit of beginning glow. And every year we had a French artist. And there was support from French foundations for that artist to come to glow. And um, later, we're going to see where this, um, where this um, event goes, this howling at the, at the sun. But I just want to give you a sense. We're beginning. The sun is going down. And this long night is about to begin on the beach in Santa Monica. And here's a spread. This is one of the. Um, maps that we use to site projects. Again, we're kind of behind the scenes, so you can see the kind of, we need to spread things out. We want this to be uh, a procession through the evening that people can walk on the beach from project to project, but not so far that they uh, get exhausted. Just the right amount of exhaustion, if you can kind of calculate that. And this is kind of the final behind the scenes thing. And I. I was intrigued by Penny showing a screenshot. This is my inbox. And I thought I would show it because some of the things I think show that it's not all glamour working on these fantastically glamorous events, particularly when you see Glow 2013 artist reject letter. And always having to reject artists, it is a bummer. But it's a supply and demand. You know, It's a really brutal world. Um, and so. But then below the reject letter is all the fundraising stuff, which is more, that is so not fun. Um, so just, it's not all lovely. But it ends up being all lovely. So I mentioned, um, I've talked about Nuit Blanche, and I mentioned that we always had French artists. And this was one of the greatest privileges for me as the curator, was I got to go to France and find artists to come to GLOW. And one year, um, we had an artist named Celeste boursier mougenot And by the way, getting French artists to come to Los Angeles is about the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> I mean, they could have paid me. They are so anxious to uh, come to uh, sort of, they just see Los Angeles as this sort of mythic, sun-draped, decadent, anything can happen place, which in a way it is. Um, <laughs> So he, um, Celeste was fascinated by what he saw on the beach, which were these lifeguard towers from, that he had remembered from Baywatch. <laughs> and um, <laughs> well, film, Hollywood. So, um, and what he did was he decided he was going to use one of these. And, and since we're speaking about film, we needed to make one of these, but we didn't have the budget. They're actually more expensive to make than you might think, but our brilliant technical director, Mark Fleischer, decided he would find one in a prop house. And so we rented this from a prop house, which, of course, Celeste loved all the more because it reinforced that sort of tie with Hollywood. And um, he drenched. So this thing is sub being subsumed in a sea of foam. 
And the rate at which this sort of um, transformation from a lifeguard tower to an, uh, sort of a mountain, a Matterhorn of foam, it, the foam machine is signals, signals are set by traffic on the Pacific Coast Highway. So depending on the velocity of traffic, the velocity of action on the foam machine. So you would never know this if you were standing there. But Celeste, being the deeply complex French artist that he is and loving everything obscure, wanted to um, create some relationship between Pacific Coast Highway and this piece. And it came through the sound signals of velocity. And the technology, the computer and the other uh, receiving instruments were housed in an RV that we rented for him that he parked just a little bit south if you're in a parking lot, and he hung out in this RV just feeling. It would be like if I went and got to hang out in Versailles. He was just so happy. He was hanging out in this RV right adjacent to the Pacific Ocean. So there are all these wonderful sort of serendipitous adventures that we get to have. Um, our next French artist um, for 2013, it, oh, and I should mention that um, Celeste went on to be the French artist at uh, the Venice Biennale last year. If any of you saw, he had these fantastic trees which sort of roved around the Giardini, again, taking signals from the environment that uh, created these um, motion sensors and these giant trees moved around. So um, in 2013, the artist was met to Brion. And he, it's fun taking these artists to the beach because this is their gallery. It'd be like the curator here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art taking an artist into the gallery. So I take them to the beach. And the first, here's, this is what he does. He gets on his hands and knees. He's in the greatest um, kind of artist studio ever. So, um, and he just loved it. And he started thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Literally, this is what he came up with. What? Oh, my time is up. Can I keep going? So he came up with this idea. Thank you. And I'm going to jump to what it is, since time is short. This is called 6.43 p.m. 6.43 p.m. on July 23rd, I think it was, was the day the sun would be, if you were standing in a particular site, the sun would be completely framed by this ring of fire on the beach. So, and then we have these cargo containers underneath and these mounds of sand over there. And all of this came about from, from um, Matu playing in the sand. And um, so that image found its way into Le Monde's um, Sunday magazine, like the Sunday New York Times magazine, which had a feature on Los Angeles art. I told you, the French love Los Angeles. Um, and here we have a drawing. This is a sort of an engineering drawing. How do we make this damn thing? And everything always takes more money than you ever can imagine it will, and more time, and it's more complex. And um, you cannot let the French artists down because they just pout. So we um, <laughs> somehow figured out a way to make this thing happen. The week before, the engineer decided the engineering he had done was wrong. And we had to line the beach with trench plates, which weigh you know, 3 million pounds each. And there aren't any anyway because there's too much construction in LA. And there's a week to go. Anyway, we found the trench plates. Uh, move these things there. We got the fire marshal to agree that we could store 500 gallons of butane on the beach. <laughs> Just all the little challenges which come up. And as you walk in, you see this wonderful lunar projection. And by the way, to get in, you're waiting in line, which is a part of GLOW. People just wait in line. But they're happy. They're on the beach. It's at night. It's festive. And they're chatting. And you know, making new friends. It's a very social event. So you get in, and you see this odd, you're above the clouds, or you're in some kind of molecule. And then you come around the corner, and you see this funky old uh, a phonograph with a scratchy LP, and a, phon a phonographic needle, and a, and a camera. And it turns out it's the Wizard of Oz. This is like we're behind the curtain. And all of this imagery is just basically the visualization of static from an old LP. There you go. So um, in 2008, 
One of the things we wanted to do to get GLOW on the map, we wanted, was to get international artists. Since the, the first GLOW, we really wanted to demonstrate we were very serious, we were ambitious, and we wanted to register GLOW as a very important art event. And, and so we did get some international artists. We thought that would up. Oh, well, did you, anyone notice that image at the very beginning by John Baldessari that we clicked by? So, sorry, I didn't talk about that. That was part of our effort to get GLOW sort of considered as a very serious event. We got John Baldessari, kind of Mr. Serious Art LA, who isn't serious at all, but is seemed to be very serious, um, to, make, to, to lend us an image so that people would take us seriously. And um, we got an artist, a French, an English artist, Usman Hawk, to create this artwork on the beach. And, I should say, one of the things we always want to do with GLOW is to create a degree of interactivity and engagement between the artwork and the audience. And that is, this kind of interactivity often finds, uh, it's mostly manifest in works of great technical complexity, a lot of high tech, as surveillance technology maybe, and other kinds of feedback technologies. And this is something that Usman Hawk is very adept at. and he created a work on the beach. A, a, this is a projection onto a wall of water, which is created through a nozzle that shoots the water 40 feet high and 65 feet wide, which is fine if you have the reservoir on adjacent reservoir of a pool of water with 25,000 gallons in it. Well, that isn't on the beach. The beach is absolutely arid. So we had to create a, a a reservoir on the beach to store enough water so that the pump could create this giant wall of water. So we lined a, 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 an artificial reservoir that we made on the beach with vinyl, pumped water in, and that was able to be the reservoir of water for this giant wall of water. And the projections you see on this wall of water, I just want you to see that they change, are determined by audio input into eight microphones which are put around the perimeter of the project. So as people clap or scream or sing or talk, which what, they didn't talk too much, they mostly screamed, um, the imagery would change. Another large project is by um, an artist, Janet Eckelman, who some of you may know. And here we're looking at her drawing of this um, suspended sculpture on the beach, which ultimately became this. And you can see not only is this sculpture formed, but the sand below. We formed these mounds of sand that mimic the, the folds of the suspended network with a very complex lighting program which would change throughout the night. And now I'm gonna, this is gonna be one project where I'm gonna let the artist speak. It's, um, Rafael Lozano Hammer, who you all know and love because he's so lo lovable and because he's so goddamn smart and does such faultlessly magical artwork. And we were very lucky to work with him in 2010. I'm not gonna play all of it. But you'll get a sense of what he was up to, his kind of playfulness and intelligence and how he brings in the audience to be actors and audience. Is the sound on? Are you sure? It's turned off I know, but I need it on. <laughs> Can't, uh, well. You can probably already see that there are projectors which are picking up these hands. There are cameras picking up these hands and then they are magnified by these projectors here. And the projectors... These are huge projectors that we had to bring in from... This is Hollywood, but we couldn't even find the right projectors. We had to bring them in from Tampa, Florida of all places. Bring cranes onto the beach, which is not easy because they sink into the sand. So we had to line the pathway. And all of this for one night, mind you. This had people completely so entranced. <laughs> and 
so delighted and so thrilled. And as, as Raphael said, the, the range of scales here. Yeah. Okay, well, it really doesn't get better than that in my mind. This is like public art at its greatest. But we have to move on. So we're going to move on to another uh, projection piece. This is, you have seen this piece because it was on the announcement. It's by um, Rebecca Mendez. And Rebecca has been fascinated by migration. She herself was an immigrant from Mexico. But she became interested in, in the migration of animals because animals migrate without worry of borders and without all of the due process required to cross borders. And, in particular, she became interested in the Arctic tern, which is the, it's, it's the animal on Earth which experiences the greatest amount of sunlight of any other animal because it's in air constantly following the sun as the sun changes in its shifting, or whatever those technical terms are, alignments or rotations or polarities. So it has the maximum exposure to sunlight. And here she is in the Arctic filming the tern. Um, most of the imagery is actually of the turns and, and their passage through Santa Monica Bay. It's a 35-foot diameter screen right on the beach. And this was adjacent to the, the ring of fire. So we had these circular wonderments on the beach. And there was also a project on the Ferris wheel, which we won't see. So you had these three giant circles on the beach. There's another circle. This is a Holiday Inn, which we were able to repurpose as a, as a screen for this piece by um, Free Waves. And you see the grid. The grid is actually an architectural element that the artist decided to use. We're under the pier, the Santa Monica Pier, with a project by uh, Shishen Wang, a Taiwanese artist, who basically goes to Costco and Home Depot and finds all kinds of little gizmos and trash bags and repurposes them into these kind of delightful, mesmerizing, uh, sort of sub-aquatic creatures, kind of, I called it Neptune's lair. And that was also, keep in mind, we're under the Santa Monica Pier. It's damp. You hear the roar of the waves coming in and the, the dampness in the old timber. Was, uh, and there was a line to get into this thing two hours long. The people waited two hours. That's when I thought, wow, we're on to something. Two hours to wait. This is one project on the carousel. I'm going to show a series of much smaller projects. I'm almost at the end. As we get smaller in time, we have to show smaller projects. Um, and so there was this orchestra which played on the, um, the Ferris wheel, and they would send their notes from one car to another. Here's howling on the uh, howling at the moon, howling at the sun, coming down to the beach. Frenzy of dancing to protect us, puppets off of giant sculptures, and finally, one of my favorites. Um, it's a piece that is, an, it's basically, it's a robotic boulder. <laughs> so, I, so this is how we're going to end. We're going to rock on and end, and thank you very much. It was delightful speaking to you.